Amen. God is good. God is good. Good afternoon, family of God. And I'd just like for you to go with me again to the Father. Jesus, I just want to personally thank you, Lord. I thank you, Jesus. I thank you for bringing me to this place that you oh so love, Father. To these people, your people, my family, your family that you oh so love. I thank you for the compassion that you've given me, Lord. I thank you for the love that you have shown me here. Lord, I thank you for the anointings that I've been honored to sit under all weekend, Father. The different anointings, Father, the different words that have come straight from heaven, Father. I thank you for the works, your good works that have began in us and that you will be faithful to complete this very day within these next few moments because you are God and you say that that's what you do and whatever you say you do, every word that you say you fulfill because that is who you are and you are not a man that you should lie. We come to you with faith, God, the gift of faith that you have given us. For that faith is not even of, of ourselves, but it is a gift of God. It is a gift of God to have faith in him. And Lord, I just thank you for we know, we have recognized, and we have taken time to say that you are a holy God. You are holy, and we honor you, Lord. We honor you, Jesus. We honor you, Holy Spirit. And we give you room to have your way in us and through us, for us, and then ultimately for your glory, Lord Jesus. Father, I thank you. I ask that in these next few moments that we see you, Jesus. Let us see you in a new way. For it is only when we see you that we can see who we really are in you and the plan that you have for us. Jesus, I thank you for this honor. What could I render to the Lord for all of the benefits that he has done to me? But to stand in front of his congregations and to declare that he is good and to give him thanks. I thank you, Lord, for who you are. In Jesus' name, we're ready for you. Amen. Amen. Wow. I, again, I'm so honored to have sat under the anointings that is, and the anointing that is still here, very present. My name is Grace Gonzalez. I'm from Houston, Texas, born and raised there. I sit under my uh, pastors, Tommy and Rachel Birchfield, out in Columbus, Texas. Uh, they're directors of Texas Bible Institute, uh, Discovery Camp, more than 25 years of leading young people to Jesus. And uh, now, you know, just more recently, in the last 10 years, uh, they've, they've planted the church, Believers World Outreach Church in Brookshire, Texas, where we believe that the Lord put us on the edge of, of Highway uh, 10, Interstate 10, because that is, you know, we say that the church's driveway is, is, is you know, God's highway. And, and we believe and we declare that we're opening up that region for the Lord, just as, as Journey Church is opening up this region here for the Lord. And I know that God has already shown himself faithful here in this place, but you ain't seen nothing yet, Pastor. You, ain't, you haven't seen nothing yet, Journey Church and Lancaster and Dallas and surrounding areas. And I just... I just say thank you. I say thank you for the invitation. Uh, thank you, Sally and David Purvis, for loving me, for inviting me, for just letting me be a part of you and everything that you are doing for the Lord. I thank Sister Sister Rod. Uh, I, I love you. I love you, and I want to tell you that I'm forever changed just by meeting you because the fire inside of you has ignited something in me that I know is eternal, and I just want to say thank you that you have changed my life forever, and I'm forever impacted by you. And to everybody else that has served and just been here, you know, just the fact that we showed up, just the fact that we showed up and others didn't, that says a lot to God. It says a lot to the pastors, and, and it is an honor. It is an honor to be here it is an honor to be here and not in a hospital bed. It is an honor to be here and not stuck in a jail cell. It is an honor to be here and not laid out in the street somewhere. Because maybe a lot of you were there at a time and you're not. You're sitting here in this chair today in the presence of God. I was in all those three places that I just mentioned and I'm so honored. And I do not take it for granted that I am here in this holy place and I am grateful. And there is no other place that I would rather be but in the love and in the presence of God. I'm nobody special. I'm just grateful 
I'm grateful that the Lord has saved me and changed me and, and is just using me as, as, as much as he wants to, as much as he gives me grace to. And I'm just here to, I'm here to do what he has told me to do. I didn't know the Lord growing up, but about five years ago, after, after an ordeal, which I will go into in a few moments, the Lord spoke to me and he said, you must go back to the hospitals and tell them how I healed you. You must go back to the jails and tell them how I set you free. And lastly, but not least, he said, you must go back to the churches and let them know that I still do miracles. That is the word. That is why I'm here. He told me that five years ago, even before I was even in a church. But again, the Lord always fulfills what he says. I want to, I want to stir up something in you and in me in these closing moments of, of this oh-so-anointed con convention. You know, just the, the convention that this ministry is under, igniting new life. You know, we need to take time to recognize these things because igniting new life is something that was birthed out of the heart of God for a purpose. And it's not hard to figure out. The purpose is to ignite new life. That is the purpose, ignite new life in us, ignite new life in our churches, ignite new life in our dreams, in our bodies, in our, in our mental states, in our, in our communities, in our cities, in our nation. Ignite new life. And he has given us the honor to be a part of it. Igniting new life. Ministries international, all around the world. And this very convention, mine eyes have seen the king. My eyes have seen the king. I'm letting you know that if, you're, if you've been sitting here, whether you got here Thursday, uh, Friday, or today, and if you have not seen the king yet, you're going to see him before you leave. And if you've already seen him, you're going to see him in a greater way before you leave because we are taking the time to honor him and to get, let him have his way, and he does not fail his people. He does not fail his people. So whatever, turn up your expectancy. Whatever, whatever you came here believing for this weekend, turn it up. Turn up that expectancy because it's going to happen. And if you came here not believing for anything, then take this time to get something, get a, a dream or something that you felt was dead because God is going to raise it tonight to life and he's going to ignite you. He is going to ignite new life in all of us. My eyes have seen the king. If you have your Bible, if you have your Bible, I'd like you to take it out. And if you could just stand with me, those that are able physically to stand. If you're not physically able, I understand and the Lord understands. But we want to honor the word that this convention was built upon and planned around. Because this, the word for this convention, it was given by God. And I think it makes a lot of sense to take time and to just read it together. And, and we stand because we honor, we honor him. We honor the word. Jesus is the word. The word is what changes lives. The only way that we're going to see difference in our lives is by being people of the word. But we cannot be people of the word if we don't get in the word. So that's why we get in the word and we take time to honor. So we're going to read Isaiah chapter 6, a few verses. In the year that King Uzziah died, in a vision, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the skirts of his train filled the most holy part of the temple. And above him stood the seraphim, each had six wings, with two each covered his own face, and with two each covered his feet, and with two each flew. And one cried to another, and they said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who cried. And the house was filled with smoke or a cloud of glory. Then said I, woe is me. Woe is me for I am undone and I am ruined. Because I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphim, heavenly beings, to me, having a live coal in his hand, 
which he had taken with tongs from off the altar. And with it, he touched my mouth. He's going to touch your mouth and said, and he's going to say, behold, this has touched your lips. Your iniquity and guilt are taken away. God is letting you know that your iniquity and your guilt is taken away. You were not built for guilt. You were formed for faith. I'm going to say that again and say it with me. I was not built for guilt. I was not built for guilt. I was formed for faith. I was formed for faith. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Then said I, here am I, send me. Father, we honor your word. And we thank you that in these next moments, God, you're going to reveal yourself to us. And you're going to ignite new life in us. And we're going to see the king and all of our guilt and all of our iniquities will be taken away as we enter into your holiness. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. I don't do that for me. We, we don't do it for us. We do it for God. He is worthy. Mine eyes have seen the king. I've titled this, these brief moments, these closing moments. My eyes have seen the king, and he is the God of miracles. He is the God of miracles. I want us, I want us all together to focus and, and realize and recognize that these next few moments with God, we're never going to have these moments again. Yes, there will be other functions. There will be other services. There will be other conferences and, and you know, retreats and things like that and conventions. And there will even be more igniting new life functions. But this very moment here and these next few moments with God of this convention that he prepared that he assigned, and that he brought us to. My eyes have seen the king in 2016, this very convention. We will not have this time again. This time will come and it will pass. And life will continue whether we're ready or not. But we declare that we are going to get ready and we're going to be ready. And I want you to know and I want us to focus on that that these next few moments we'll never have again. And so that being said, let us push in. What did you come here for? I didn't drive almost four hours for nothing. I've enjoyed the fellowship. I've enjoyed the, the awesome heavenly divine food. I've enjoyed the lattes. But God did not bring me four hours to drink lattes. God does not bring me and he does not bring you anywhere divinely assigned without a purpose. And everywhere I go, I expect miracles, I expect signs, and I expect wonders. And it's not because of me, it's because of the king, and it's because of what I've seen. It's because of, it's because of what I know he can do. And if you're ready for that, he will not fail. You, you will see the miracles and the signs and the wonders. I have seen the lame walk. I have seen the people in the wheelchairs get out. I was one of them. I have seen the dead come to life. My niece was one of them. I have seen people set free. What did you come here for? Don't come here to leave the same. You come here to be forever changed by the power of God and the anointing of the Holy Spirit that breaks yokes. I'm excited. I'm excited about these next few moments. I'm an evangelist by heart, and that's only because God said. I, um, like I said, I'm nobody special. You know, I, anything good in me is only the grace of God. And it just so happens that my name is Grace, but it, you know, me, my name Grace totally does not compare to the grace of God. I still don't even understand fully the grace of God. I don't believe that we can fully understand it until we get there and see him in all of his perfection. But we try, we try our best with his help, and, and he gets us through victoriously. And so I, 
You know, I'm so grateful to be able to call him Abba. I'm so grateful because I didn't have a, a, a background. I didn't come from a family tree that was very promising. My grandfather was in the mafia. He was a murderer. He killed many, many people. Even now to this day, there are certain neighborhoods in Houston where I can't, where my family doesn't say a certain last name for fear of them retaliating against us because of all the people that my grandfather killed. He ended up getting killed himself by his own people. It, it was a setup. But that's, that's, the, that's the law of the world, that you live by the gun, you die by the gun. You live by, you live by and doing, you know, living in greed. You're going to die with that greed in your heart. But thank God that he shows us a new way and that he's given us a new way and that I don't have to be defined by my family tree. Because he says that he is the true vine and that now I am connected to him and that I can bear his fruit. You can bear his fruit. You don't have to bear the fruit of, of addictions. You don't have to bear the fruit of crime. You don't have to bear the fruit of, of depression, of poverty. No, he says, get connected to me. The Lord says, get connected to me and be one of my branches. Be something that flows out of me. And you will bear good fruit, lasting fruit. So that was my grandfather. My grandmother was a prostitute, very well-known prostitute in the neighborhood. And she ended up losing her mind and then losing her life as well. My father was a, just a fountain of rage. My mother was a depressed, emotional roller coaster. And, and that's... And that's where I grew up. That's where we grew up. And I didn't know that I had a choice to be something different. I didn't know that there was another life to be lived. And so I did what they did. I ended up getting into that lifestyle. From the time of a very young teenager, I became heavily addicted to drugs and alcohol and a life of crime. And, and I was just heading down a road of destruction. I believed that by the age of 25 that I was either going to be dead or in prison for a really long time like a lot of my family. And I was okay with that. I was okay with that because I did not know hope. And I don't want to I don't want to pass a moment by to say that no, I don't believe there's anybody in here that that is that far deep into despair. Because even in the church, even in a church and in a service like this, there can be people that are so far deep in despair. But if you didn't know that there was a hope, there is a hope for every area of your life. I'm very passionate about miracles. I'm very passionate about evangelism. I'm very passionate about street outreaches. And that's something that the Lord has done in my life personally. And that's why now... I give back because I'm just so grateful and because that's what he told me to do. So I grew up like that. Over 10 years, I was, I was an alcoholic. I was a drug addict. In 2011, almost five years ago, the Lord saved me. He saved my life. He saved my soul. This year, actually, July 1st, Pastor Sally, was the fifth year anniversary of the car accident that I'm going to get into and, and every year on the anniversary, the Lord gives me a word, a personal word for, for my year, for that year. And this year, he said, this is your fifth anniversary. So five is the number of grace. Five. So this year is going to be your amazing grace year. And so I've received this as my amazing grace year. But then God went further to say, and he said, it's not only for you, Grace. Everywhere that you go, that is what you declare for the people and for the churches that you speak to, that this is going to be your amazing grace year. You're going to see the grace of God in your life like you've never seen it before. And if you believe it and receive it, it's going to happen because he doesn't fail. Not because I'm telling you, because he's telling you, and because you have faith in him. And so that was, it's been five years. In 2011, I went out on yet another suicide attempt. And I got in my car, and I went in on the freeway with the mindset of whatever happens, happens. I did not know God. I did not know that I was in darkness, which I was at that time, and that I was giving room 
to the enemy to destroy my life day after day after day. Don't give the enemy room, any room, to work in your life because he'll take advantage of it. And so I went out that night, and I said, whatever happens, happens, and it did. I ended up wrecking on, after a series of events, I ended up wrecking my car on the freeway. I flipped numerous times. They stopped counting after three. And then all of a sudden, everything went black. I don't know, I don't exactly know how much time passed before I heard a voice in my ear, and it was a man. I looked, it, it was an elderly man who I now believe was an angel sent by the Lord. And he woke me up, and he said, I need to get you out of here. And I looked over him, and I said, no. I said, leave me here. And he said, no, I need to get you out of here because your car is on fire. And so he undid my seatbelt. He grabbed me by my arms. He pulled me out of the car, and he laid me flat down. This is midnight on a giant Houston freeway. For whatever reason, there wasn't a lot of cars passing by. It was dark. I was alone. And then it started to rain. You know, when things are bad, the enemy, and you give room to the enemy, he'll take things from bad to worse. And so I'm laying there alone. He puts me down, fades down. And he says, he comes to my ear and he says, don't try to move because the bones are sticking out of your leg. I didn't know at that moment that I had been burned. I had burns on my body. I had cuts. I had bruises. I was bleeding from different places. And I had a severely mangled right leg. The bones from here down had come out and shattered. I mean, my leg was severely mangled. And he said, but don't worry. The ambulance is on their way. And he left me. I don't know where he went. And in that moment, I'm alone, and it's, it's dark, and you might be alone here today. You might feel like you're alone. You might feel like you're in the dark rain, like I felt that night. And in that moment, in those moments, honestly, the pain in my heart was worse than the pain in my body because I felt that I had gotten dealt a raw deal in life, and I was angry at God if he existed. I didn't even know if he existed, but if he did, I was mad at him. And I was a person that was always very real. <laughs> I still am, for the glory of God. And in those moments, I looked up at the sky, rain falling on me, just at the point of death. And I spoke out of my mouth. And I said, really, God, now this? And then I turned my face from him, as it's been discussed. Let me encourage you to be real with God today. God's not looking for a show. We're not looking for a show. We're not looking to see how high you jump. We're not looking to see how much you clap. Let me give you the freedom to say that if you're hurt, you're hurt. If you're angry, you're angry. If you feel like you're desperate, then you're desperate. It's okay. Be real with God because when you're real with God, then he can get real with you and he will show you his real power. So I want to give you, give us that freedom to be real in the presence of God today. And so when I turned my face down, I woke up in hell. I praise God for Sister Pastor Rita here who saw heaven. Well, I was the opposite. I went to hell. <laughs> I went to hell not even knowing that there was a real hell because I didn't know that there was a real God. And when I opened my eyes and I was in hell, and, and I'm not here to give you a big, you know, flashy story of this was hell and this and that because I wasn't there for very long, and I'm so glad that I wasn't there, and I don't, and I don't have enough stuff to write a book on hell. I, I, I don't want enough stuff to write a book on hell. I was there for only a few moments, and all I saw was flames, but even more than what I saw is what I felt. I felt a fear that I believe is unknown here on the earth. It's a fear that I had never felt before, and it was a fear of, of desperation. And in those moments, I could hear myself think. This is what I thought to myself. I said, oh, my God, I'm in hell, and I deserve it. That's what I thought. That's what, and I could hear myself think that. And, you know, 
even people out on the streets that don't know that they were created by God, even me in that moment that I didn't know that I was created by God, that I was a spirit. But in that moment when my spirit was in a place that God had not created me to be, I knew. I knew. And somehow I knew that I deserved it, not even knowing anything of the scripture. I mean, you got to really put yourself in my position that I didn't know the scriptures of, you know, sin leads to condemnation and, and God gives you righteousness. I didn't know that. But in that very moment, my spirit knew I deserve this. I deserve this because I'm a sinful person. So trust God. Even if you don't have the words to say, trust God that when you get in his presence, that he's going to minister to you. He's going to minister to your spirit because he created you. And so after I, as soon as I thought that, I just felt like I went, Shoo. and I woke up in an emergency room. But I could not get the, the sight and the fear out of me of what I had saw. And, you know, I think, I don't think it's a coincidence. And, you know, and Pastor Rod does, does it, didn't know that about me. And I don't think it's a coincidence that this title of, of this convention is I have seen. Because, you know, seeing is different from looking. Yeah. Seeing is different from looking. Because you can look and look away. But what I saw, I couldn't unsee. When I, those flames that I saw, I couldn't unsee. I thank God now that I have seen Jesus, and I can't unsee Jesus. And that's, that's why my prayer for us today and for you today is for all of us to see God in a new way and to see Jesus here present. Because when we see him, that changes the rest of your life. It changes the way you live. It changes the way you think. It changes the way you love people. It changes the way you feel. It gives you passion, and it gives you zeal, and it, and it pushes you to push past the pain and push past weariness. And, I mean, anything, anything that comes to me throughout the day, I push past it because I have seen glory. I have seen glory. There's a scripture in the Bible that says that the glory of God is in the face of Jesus Christ. That's why it's so important to see the king. That's why it's so important to see his face. Because the glory of God, the glory, your hope for glory is in the face of Jesus Christ. And so I wake up in an emergency room and there's surgeons running all around me and I'm you know, this hardcore gangster girl, woman, turned into a crying baby at that moment. And I was alone again. And I just remember that fear. And I grabbed one of the surgeons by his, by his coat. And I looked at him and I said, please, I said, don't put me to sleep. Because if you do, I'm not going to wake up. I really believe that if they put me to sleep, I was going to end up in hell again. I wasn't going to make it. And it was such a, such a crippling fear. And he looked at me and said, I'm sorry, but we have to try to save your life and save your leg. And in those moments, I knew that he wasn't going to listen to me. And you, you might have had moments like that in your life where you've tried to reach out maybe for help. You've tried to tell people how you feel. You've tried to express yourself. And people respond the best way they can, or sometimes they don't. And that's where I was in that moment. And you just know, oh, they're not going to listen to me. And so you go off, and you just continue in that despair. Well, in that moment, I didn't have the chance. I didn't have the opportunity to just walk off and continue doing what I was doing. It was a matter of life and death. And in those moments, I said, the only thought that came to my head was, well, I'm alone. Let me try to talk to God again. That same God that I just cursed moments ago, that same God that I just gave all, all my anger to, the same God that I just turned away from in disgust. Let me try to go to that God again. He is your only hope, you know. And that's a good thing because he is able. He is able. And so in those moments, in my tears, I looked up, and all I had time to say 
was, God, help me. And that was it. I was out. And, you know, here, all weekend, we've had opportunities to come and to say, Lord, you are holy. God, I trust you with this, and I trust you with that. And it is such a privilege. And if you have not taken the time to come or have not pushed yourself to come up, then do that today before you leave. Because we have the time. We have the opportunity here. Well, you have the opportunity to pour your heart out. When in those moments, all I had time to say was, God, help me. But I thank God that even though my words were few, they were real. And even more than my words being real, his grace was real, Lord. His grace was more real. And where my sin abounded, his grace abounded much more. And because I turned to him in, my, in, in the only moment of what I thought I had left of hope, then he came through. He came through. That is the kind of God that he is. So when you feel like you're down to your last hope, use all that energy and give it all to God. Give it all to God here. And so I wake up the next morning. Ten hours had passed. I wake up the next morning. I'm in a hospital bed next to a window. And again, I wake up and I'm alone. And then I felt all the excruciating pain in my body. But I wasn't even focused on that because when I woke up, the window was open next to me and the sun was shining in. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. And when I looked at that window, and when I saw the sun shining in, and I realized, okay, I'm not in hell. <laughs> I'm seeing the glory of God and his creation. I knew by myself, I didn't have a pastor there. I didn't have a preacher. I didn't have a brother or sister in the Lord there. I didn't have any, anybody to tell me, hey, this is what happened to you. God saved your life. You know, he did this, and it was his grace. No, no. And the good thing is that I didn't need anybody there because he is well able, the Holy Spirit is well able to speak to you on his own. You don't need me. You don't need somebody else. He is well able to speak to you. And in that moment, I began to weep because just how I had known that I was in hell and I deserved it, in that very moment, that next moment, in my tears, I knew it is that Jesus was the Son of God and that he had saved me. I knew it, and in that moment, in my tears, by myself, again, nobody to tell me, hey, there's something called the prayer of repentance or a prayer of salvation, or this is how you give, you know, uh, give your life to God. I had nobody there, but God is well able. He created me. He created you, and in that moment, in my tears, with a humble heart and a grateful heart, I said, okay, God, now I know. I said, now I know that it's been you that has been saving my life all along. Because that wasn't the first time he saved my life. The life that I was living, I had, I mean, I, ended, I was in the hospital probably a probably hundred times or, you know, close to that for overdoses. I would wake up in hospitals because I would have seizures. I didn't know. People would tell me, hey, you had a seizure, this and that. You know, different things. But in that moment, for whatever reason, I can't think of any other but God's timing, that my eyes were opened that it was him who had been saving me all along. And I said, okay, God, because you saved my life, now you can have it. I didn't even know what that meant. But I said it. But something that, that, the whole, that now I can see, I look back and I see how he was just leading me and guiding me, just as the scripture says that he is our guide. And he will lead you. He will lead you when you don't know what you're doing, when you don't know what to do. And he led me to speak, to, to just speak out loud, not knowing the power of life or death that I could have in my tongue. But he led me to speak. I mean, because I could have thought that in my head. I could have laid there and say, you know, in my head thought, oh, okay, well, I'm alive. Thank you, God, you know, whatever. No. But for whatever reason, I, I knew nobody there was with me, but I was, I was speaking out loud. I was, and I said, thank you, because you saved my life, now you can have it. So then the surgeon, a surgeon comes and he busts in through the room at that moment. He starts reading a chart, uh, tells me you had this and this in your system, you know, alcohol, drugs. And I, in my head, I was like, well, tell me something new. I mean, I, you know, that's not surprising. I drink and do drugs every day. I said, so that's nothing new. And he said, well, he said, um, 
you know, and you're lucky you're alive. He said, because we have many people that come here into these hospitals in less serious car accidents than you were, and they, they're either dead or in a coma. And, and he said, the worst thing you have is just a severely mangled leg. And he said, you're lucky you were wearing your seatbelt because that's the only thing that saved you from flying through the windshield. And in that moment, the spirit of God that had already come inside of me, I spoke up again and I spoke out and I said, no. I said, the seatbelt is not what saved me. I said, God saved me. And he didn't pay attention, of course. He just, you know, kept on going. Testing. Testing, testing, testing. We're good, we're good. It might be going out, though. And so he began to read the report, and he said, well, you're not. You give your life to Christ. You know, we have to, then, then there's a process of going through being set free of, of mindsets. So don't be discouraged if you feel like, man, I accepted Christ 20 years ago or 10 years ago or 15 years ago or, or yesterday. Don't be discouraged if you feel like, man, I'm not where I, where I should be. Don't be discouraged in the sense that, that God is faithful to lead you. As long as you keep surrendering in every season, in every season, remember to surrender. You just keep surrendering to him and keep coming to his presence and don't stay back there because you're, you know, full of despair. As long as you keep doing that, then God is going to take you through, through that process of getting, of getting rid and breaking you free of those negative mindsets. So though I had given my life to Christ, in that very next moment when he told me I wasn't going to walk again for six months, I, I thought that was a long time, you know. I was 22 years old, and I'm thinking – and then I'm thinking about the life that I live, and I was like, in my head, I said, what am I going to do for six months, not walking? I was like, and who's going to take care of me? I mean, I have friends that will party with me, that will do this and this with me, but I don't have any friends that are going to bring me food or, or help me take a shower or help me do I couldn't think of one person. And so in that moment, I, I started to fall back into a depression and into that negative mindset. And so six months Ended up turning into almost two years. Just like you, sister, they did a surgery, didn't work. Did another surgery, major surgeries, didn't work. And they, they came to me after the second surgery and they said, well, Ms. Gonzalez, you're, you're actually not getting better. We thought you would be recovering. You're actually getting worse. Because at the time that, that your bones and your, your flesh opened up on the freeway, you got an infection. And it is an, it is an unidentifiable infection that we don't even know what it is. And it is eating up the rest of your leg, and it's going to continue to go up. And it will eventually affect the rest of your body. And they said, we don't know what to do. This was after two major surgeries. My, the injury was only from here down. But at that point, from here all the way up to here down, my whole leg was black. It did not work anymore. I was in a wheelchair. My leg would come, had come out like this, and they couldn't, they couldn't put it straight. It was just like that. So I was, I mean, I have to cover it up because I didn't want to see the stares of people, you know, things like that. And just, I was always scared that somebody was going to hit me or touch me. That was almost two years, almost two years of that. So, yes, when I get the opportunity to stand for the word of God, I stand. And yes, when I get the opportunity to praise and, and to drive four hours to, to Lancaster to be in an anointing like this, yes, I go. And I don't question it. Because there was for almost those two years that I would have wished that somebody would have came and brought me to church. That I would have wished that somebody would have struggled with my wheelchair and, and sweated a little bit so that I could have been in an anointing like this. But you know what? Even then, even then, I, even though I didn't have somebody there physically, the Holy Spirit was always there. He was always there. There's no doubt in my mind that he will be with you in each and every place. And so after those two surgeries, they let me leave for, for a little while, and they said, you'll come back in a week for that third surgery. And they said, if that doesn't work, then we're going to have to amputate your leg to stop that infection from going any further. And so I went out, of course, just angry, 
And, and that day, a girl called me and said, hey, let's go out and let's go, let's go drinking and let's go, you know, this and that. And I said, okay. So they came in a van, got my wheelchair, picked me up in a van. So it's like the enemy will help you. The enemy will help you to continue down a path of destruction. So the next time us as Christians, so now that I know God and that, I, and that, I, that I'm a Christian and that I follow Jesus Christ, I try my best with the help of the grace of God to help people. Just, I mean, don't, sometimes we could be in church and be so caught up with ourselves and you see somebody struggling or you know that you got your neighbor in, in a wheelchair and a walker, help them get to church because you will have no idea how you can change that person's life. Hold the door open. That's how we will, that's how we will be known as, as, as children of God, by the love that we show to one another. Hold that door open. Be courteous to one another. Encourage each other. Compliment someone. Especially women. If you think another woman is beautiful, tell her she's beautiful. It's not about, oh, well, she's too pretty, so I'm going to. No, you tell that woman she's beautiful. So the devil was helping me go further and further into destruction. And so we did. We went out that night, and I wasn't even, you know, I was just in my despair, in my, you know, depression. So we ended up going to this, after all night, to this apartment. And it was just me, this girl, and this one other guy that I didn't even know. And they kind of went off. And, I mean, I'm in a wheelchair, so I just stayed in, in the living room by myself. And, you know, they got high and drunk and they knocked out and I just I fell asleep in my wheelchair eventually well that very next morning I was awakened by the audible voice of God and he said grace wake up and I opened my eyes and he began to speak to me audibly I didn't even know that that was something that existed and he said he just began to speak and in my wheelchair in my circumstances, the word of God came to me, and he spoke and said, I'm letting you know right now that it doesn't matter what the doctors say, but you are going to walk, you are going to talk, and you will smile again, but it's going to be for my glory. I don't know what kind of circumstance you're in here today, but if you will open your heart and open your ears and open your eyes to the word of the Lord, and to the face of Jesus Christ, he will speak into your circumstances, no matter how horrible it looks. And in those moments, again, I was real with God. You, I, didn't, I didn't leap for joy, even if I could. I, did, I was sitting there because I, I had heard him. I knew that I had heard him. And then at the same time, I was just hurt. I was brokenhearted. I was sad. But I was real. And I began to cry when I heard him say that. And I looked up and I said, okay, God. I said, but look at me. You have to do something. Let me tell you that it's okay to come in your brokenness. It's okay to come in your anger. It's okay to come in your despair and say, you know what, God, I've heard your word. I've heard it. I've heard it all weekend. But look at me, God. I don't even know. How, I don't see how. I don't see how. But you have to do something. If they say that you are who you say you are, then I believe you to do something. And I promise you that he will. I went back after that a few days later to the hospital for supposedly another surgery. And they did. They actually went in. And then when I woke up after that surgery, the surgeons came and they said, well, we don't know what happened, but you don't have that infection anymore said, you don't have that infection anymore, and you've actually started to grow a little bit of bone. And in that moment, I just, I began to weep. I began to weep because in front of the surgeon. I didn't care who was around because I knew what I had heard from the Lord, and I knew that his word had come to pass, and I knew in that moment that he was real. And I knew that from that moment forward, it was just going to be glory to glory. And it was a process. So the infection stopped. It was a process. You know, I had to learn how to walk again. I went into, from the wheelchair, I went to a walker. I would, then I went to, to crutches. Then I went to a cane. And, I mean, that took another almost half a year. And then I remember when they finally released me, 
when they were finally going to release me, you know, all, all of, you know, from all the hospital visits and everything, they sat me in a room and they said, well, they said, you can walk, but you're never going to be able to run again. You're never going to be able to jump again. You're never going to be able to do anything, you know, that requires, um, you know, using your ankle much because I don't have an ankle anymore. Actually, from here down, I'm standing on one pole and my ankle, I can't, like you do this with your foot, I can't do that with this foot anymore because it's just metal. I don't have no ligaments. I don't have anything. So that's why I have a limp. That's why I'm stiff in this leg. But they saw the bad, and I saw the miracle of Jesus Christ that I was walking. And so they're telling me, so, you know, sometimes we just got to switch our, our focus a little bit because they're telling, they told me, well, you can walk, but you're never going to do this, and but you're never going to do that, and but, and it's like, whoa, 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 what happened to, oh, we're going to cut your leg off, but now you can walk? And, and, and what happened to you have a, a, an infection that's going to eat up the rest of your body, but now you have no infection? What happened to that? And so even though while they were speaking all this negative, this negativity to me, all I heard was, you're going to walk. That's all I heard. That's all I needed to hear. And even while they continued to, to speak a negative report again, I heard the audible voice of God. And, and ever since then, I hear the audible voice of God. I'm not going to say it's every day. But I, but I hear it often. And, and that, is a, that is a gift of God that, that he offers to anybody. And he doesn't just speak to me like that. He speaks to me in other ways, you know, and sometimes I don't hear from him, and it's, it's, it's his doing. And I receive however he wants to speak to me. And in that moment, in that room, while they were giving me those negative reports, I heard the voice of the Lord, and he said, Grace, don't worry. He said, because they said that you cannot run physically, I'm going to cause you to run spiritually. And that was it. And I've been doing that ever since. Like I said, this month was five years since the car accident, but actually, like, you know, walk, walking on my own and, and being, you know, full time, you know, in God, it's only been three years. And yet, and yet, I've done so much for him he's allowed me to do so much it's about it's almost every weekend or that every week that I'm in two or three other different places telling people about Jesus telling people that he is still who he says he is telling people that he can do what he says he can do telling the the churches that God still does miracles why why because he said it because he fulfills what he says if you had a word from God, if God told you something 20 years ago, like you with the CD, look, look now at the fruit. And it has such an anointing on it. You have such an anointing. And that is the word of God that was fulfilled, that has been fulfilled. I want you to think of something, a word. It could have been 20 years ago from God that he told you or a dream or a, a, a loved one. Something that you feel has been lost or died. And I want you to think of that in these next moments. Because in, in, in the closing moments, you're going to have an opportunity to come and offer that what you thought was dead, what you thought was lost. Offer it to God and watch him ignite a new life in it. And he has caused me to run spiritually. And, and I tell you that, not for me. I know, I, I know what he's done in my life. I know what he's doing in my life. I know what the relationship I have with him every day. I don't have to explain that to people. I'm telling you that for you and to the, for the glory of God. Because, you know, I think a lot of people, they, they quote, um, you know, we overcome by the blood of the lamb and the word of my testimony. A lot of people use that scripture I have seen um, when they're going to share their testimony. You know, because they... You, they they use that, and it's not bad. It's not bad. But I just, I started to realize, and God showed me that a lot of, a lot of us, and I probably even it, it did it in the beginning, without knowing that we focus so much on, on that part of the scripture, you know, my testimony. And it's like, but if it were not for the blood of the lamb, I would not even have a testimony. So that's what, that's why I share my testimony, but, but it's not about 
Because it is. It's a creative miracle that I was in a wheelchair and now I'm walking. It's, it's a creative miracle that I was, that I was bound heavily with drugs and, and alcohol for over 10 years and that now I'm free for the glory of God and free indeed. Yes, all that's a, all that's a miracle. But me, that happening to me is not going to help you in the situation that you're in. Because that was my story. But what will help you is the blood of the lamb that made it happen for me. And that's what's available for you. It is the blood of the lamb, the blood of Jesus Christ that still holds that power. That he is the God of miracles. He is the God of miracles. As I said in the beginning, that is what he wants. That is what I believe from the Lord that in these closing moments he wants, he wants us to push into. He wants, us to, he wants to ignite new life. He wants us to see the king. And he wants us to really believe that he is still the God of miracles. And, you know, I know that there, there might be, and we're all a miracle, you know, if we really think about it. And, and I know I heard Pastor Rita's miracle story this morning, and that was amazing. And maybe there's some, some other people here that have miracle testimonies like that that we have not heard. However, and I've had my miracles. However, I don't believe that this is it. I do not believe that this is it because God takes us from glory to glory. So, yes, I was in, I was in a wheelchair and I was lame and now I walk and I was blind, blind and now I can see. But there is more and I want more and I want you to expect more. And though you've been healed and though you've been delivered and though you've been set free, I want you to know that Jesus Christ has more for you today. And it is in the face of Jesus Christ. It is in the face of the king. And are we going to press in? Are we going to press in and say, you know what, God, that thing that I thought had died, that thing that I thought was lost, Lord, I'm going to come and lay it at your feet, and I don't have to know how it happens. I'm going to take my miracle any way it comes. Because anything that comes from you is good. And it is lasting. It is lasting. That's what I want for all of us here today. Because there's some that are in despair. We're all on different levels. We're all going through different things. We all have different needs. And we all have a need. I don't have to go to every one of you to ask if you have a need. I know you have a need because we're here on this earth. I have a need. But, you know, it is not so much our needs that move the hand of God. It is our faith. It's our faith that moves the hand of God. It is, the, it is our faith that brings the miracle. And miracles are an expression of the Father's love. He loves us. He is our Father. There is a scripture that says he loves us like he loves Jesus. He loves you like he loves Jesus. I mean, what kind of great love is that? A love that we can't even understand. And that's why, though, I, I could, you know, I could hold, and, and I do, I, I could hold on to the, you know, that, that I will always be grateful for, that he took me out of a wheelchair and that now I can walk. And, and yes, I, I, he, by his grace, I go around telling, telling that miracle story and sharing it for his glory. But I don't come here to just do that and sit back. No, I want more because that was good and that was then, but I want more and he has more. And it breaks my heart and I'm tired of seeing, of seeing people in the churches especially us who are supposed to know who God is and who are supposed to take him at his word fully, sitting back, sitting back and just saying, well, that was 20 years ago. You know, maybe that was for them or maybe oh, I'm too old. I'm 80. I'm 90. I'm 100 or whatever. I can't do anything. No. God is a God of miracles. And that is my that is my passion. That is my desire everywhere I go. And even in here, that is my desire for you. To believe that God is who he says he is and that he can do what he says he can do. Get bold about your faith. Yes, the Bible says that if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we can move a mountain. But I was there five years ago. I was there five years ago where my faith was the size of a mustard seed. And yes, it moved mountains. But now five years later, I don't want my faith to be that small. I want my faith to be bigger because, it, because, and that's what the Lord revealed to me. He said, Grace, if you have 
faith the size uh, of a mustard seed and you can move a mountain, imagine what you could move with faith the size of a mountain. And he takes us from faith to faith. So, I mean, I'm all for mustard seed faith. I love it because that is, I feel like that is a gift of the grace of God that he gives us when we first, you know, know who he is. But I'm not there anymore. I, sometimes I got more than one mountain that I need to move. Sometimes I got ten mountains that need to get out my way. And that, that little faith is not going to do it. You got people in your families that have problems bigger than a mountain. You have issues in your finances, in your health, that are bigger than the size of a mountain. We need bigger faith. We need focused faith. We need bold faith. We need fierce faith. Grace gives. The grace of God gives. But faith takes. Faith takes. We need to push through. And that's, that's what the Lord challenged me to do in these moments and is challenging all of us together because everything that the Lord has us do it we're doing it together to press in and to realize okay God this convention 2016 this very moment will never come again will never come again yes there will be other greater moments but why pass this one up what if this could be your miracle moment for that son or daughter that you believed for maybe 20 years ago, maybe 10 years ago, maybe you're still believing for, but there's a part of you that kind of let that go. Like you still, you still have a hope, but you let go of that, of that fierce faith that you once used to have. Because, and that happens, not with, with, our, with our children or with our family members or with our circumstances. It happens when it takes as long as 20 years sometimes. Is that we start off with like, yes, you know, when the, the lost son is out there or the alcoholic daughter or whatever, it's like, yes, they're going to be a, a man or woman of God. I declare it. And, and you do this and you do that. And then five years goes by, ten years goes by, and you're still like, yes, I do. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it. And you're still like, yes. And you pray over them while you're sitting down. And you just, but that fierce faith, we let it go too soon. And that is what the Lord would have me challenge all of us here today is that what are those things? If this if, if we're sitting under the anointing of igniting new life, and that is something, like I said, that was birthed out of the heart of God, then that's what he wants to do. He wants to ignite new life. So let us all, let us all look for something and, and think of that thing that, what is it? Is it your health? Is it your finances? Is it a loved one? Is it a dream? that you wanted to do, even if it's something that you feel like you cannot physically do anymore because of your age or whatever, bring it to God and watch him do a miracle. Just watch him do a miracle in your circumstances and in you. Do you believe that he is who he says he is and that he can do what he says he can do? I promise you that if you pick up, if you pick up that shield of fierce faith again, he will ignite you. He will ignite new life. He will ignite you so much to like how my brother over here said so beautifully last night, I don't need a cheerleader to get me pumped up. I don't need somebody to, to, to manipulate me into having a passion for God. I know what he's done. I know that he's a God of miracles. And that's what I want for you to believe again. And if you believe it, well, believe it some more. Don't be closed off. Don't be closed off. Just be open. So these are these final moments. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? You decide right now what you're going to do with these closing moments. I'd like for you to close your eyes. Decide in these moments, these closing moments, Lord, you ordained, you ordained for me to be here under the, the anointing that you birthed in igniting new life ministries. Whether you're a part of it or not, by membership or not, it doesn't even matter. It's something that was birthed out of the heart of God and we're sitting under that anointing. 
igniting new life. And Isaiah 6, 5, my eyes have seen the king. So that's what he wants to do in these moments. He wants to ignite new life. He wants to reveal himself to you. And he wants to show you that he is still and will always be and continues to be the God of miracles. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. I believe in you. I believe in you. You're the God of miracles. Do you believe it today? Do you believe that he can ignite new life in you? The God who was and is to come. The power of the risen one. He's the God who brings the dead to life. He's the God of miracles. He's the God of miracles. Oh, yes. The God who was and is to come. Let the word, let the word just go over you today. The power of the risen one. God who brings the dead to life. You're the God of miracles. You're the God of miracles. Oh, yes. He's the God who was and is to come. The power of the risen one. The power of the risen one. The God who brings the dead to life. The God who brings the dead to life. You're the God of miracles. You're the God of miracles. We were created to worship. The God who was and is to come. The power of the risen one. The power of the risen one. The God who brings the dead to life. The God who brings the dead to life. You're the God of miracles. You're the God of miracles. It's open. His, his throne room is open. I would encourage each and every one of you to push your way down here. Come down here. And when you get up here, come all the way as far as you can get to leave room for the other people. These closing moments, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Are you going to press in that thing? Bring that thing that you thought was dead. Bring that thing that you thought was lost. Maybe it's your health, your family, your finances. This is it. You, we will never have these moments again. And let the word be sung over you. Let the word of God be washed over you. Let the anointing of God break the yokes of bondage. And you say... You say with everything in you, even if you don't believe it in your mind, but you speak it with your mouth. It doesn't have to make sense in your head. You speak it with your mouth and say, God, I believe that you are who you say you are and that you can do what you say you can do. Not just for everybody else, not just for the people who are ministering, but for me, God. And I don't know how you're going to do it, but I'm going to stop asking how. All I need to know is that you love me. And miracles are an expression of the Father's love. We'll move chairs if we have to. We can get her down here. You're fine. You're fine. You're fine. 
There is room for everybody in the anointing of God. There is room for everybody in the heart of God. I believe in miracles. I believe in miracles. God, we honor you. We honor you and we say thank you for these moments that we have in your presence. These moments that are so unique that will never come again. This exact moment will never come again. That is why, Lord, we press in and we press through. Because we know that these moments here, what we do in these moments is going to last for eternity. It's going to last for eternity. And when we go to heaven and God starts to read us about our lives, he's going to say, remember when you were in Igniting New Life Ministries in that convention in 2016, and when you decided to believe me, that is where there was a shift in your body. That is where there was a shift in your finances. That is where there was a shift in your mindset. That is where there was a shift in your church. That is where there was a shift in your heart. And you're going to be so glad that you took these moments, that we took these moments to say, God, you are who you say you are, and you can do what you say you can do. And we will live our lives as such. We will speak our words as such. We will love people as such. We will encourage people as such. We will not be afraid to share the gospel even in these times. Even in these times, but even more so we will share the gospel because we are confident. We are confident in the gospel and what you say you can do. And we are not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For it is the power of salvation unto all men. All men. He's the God who was and is and is to come. The God who was and is to come. The power of the risen one. The power of the risen one. Oh, yes. The God who brings the dead to life. You're the God of miracles. You're the God of miracles. He's the God who was and is to come. The power of the risen one is in you. The power of the risen one. The one who brings the dead to life. You're the God who brings the dead to life. You're the God of miracles. The God of miracles. I declare in this moment, by the power and the authority of Jesus Christ, that everything that you thought was dead, everything that you thought was life, in this, in this very moment, in this very moment, he is igniting new life. He is igniting new purpose. He is igniting new dreams. He is igniting new health. And you don't have to work for it. You don't have to work for it. You don't have to do nothing but say, I believe. I believe and I receive. I declare life that those things that were dead in you are living again from this very moment. That you will not die, but you will live to declare the works of the Lord. And that you will live every day, every day saying, Lord, what could I ever offer to you? What could I render to the Lord for all of his benefits towards me? But to stand in the midst of your congregations and to bless you with thanksgiving and to live my life with thanksgiving and in the power and the authority. There are powers of darkness that have been working on this earth. But the difference is, the difference is from them and us and from what's going on out there is that, that pow those powers of darkness out there have no authority. We have power and we have authority. You have authority in the name of Jesus Christ, the name above all names. 
from this day forward, I declare that you live your life believing that nothing is ever impossible for God and that no word from him will ever go unfulfilled and that you can change the world no matter how young, no matter how old, no matter how you look, you can change the world because he has called you to do it. And you're going to allow yourself to be available. The prayer partners are free to pray with the people. We're going to continue with this song. I just want you to give it your all. I'll be praying for I'll be praying in the altar and other prayer partners are are welcome to pray as well. But let's press in and let's give God our all and say, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for Thursday, Friday, for Saturday. And thank you for the rest of eternity that we have with you. And for this gift of faith that you have given us to continue to believe in you for the God of miracles. The God who was and is to come. The power of the risen one, oh Jesus, you're the God who brings the dead to life, you're the God of miracles, you're the God of miracles. Yes, we believe you. We believe you for signs, miracles, and wonders right now in these moments. We believe you that coming up. Coming up in these next moments, we will see your signs, your miracles, and your wonders for the glory of Jesus Christ. I just got a word from the Lord that I just want to speak over all of us. That thing that you thought disabled you, whether it be physically, financially, mentally, educationally, physically or spiritually or emotionally, that thing that the enemy tried to use to disable you, that very thing God is going to use to enable you. Not disabled, but enabled for the glory of God. Not disabled, but enabled for the glory of God. I'm not disabled, but enabled for the glory of God. Doesn't matter what anybody else says. Doesn't matter what doctor's reports say. It doesn't matter the handicap sign that they gave me. It doesn't matter about my limp. It doesn't matter of my stiffness. My physical pain doesn't even matter. I am not disabled. I am enabled for the glory of God the Father. We are not a disabled church. We are not a disabled body of Christ. We are enabled by the grace of God to do the works that he has called us to do. And we will change the world. We will be bold. We will see signs, miracles, and wonders in our day. Because it's the same God. It's the same God. He does not change. Thank, thank you, Lord. Thank you. That that thing that the enemy would have tried to use to disable us, you are using that very thing to enable us in Jesus' name. 